we have 500k and at the beginning of this our goal here is to get a new bond and for a new bond we're gonna have to get ourselves 13.5 million gold i granted myself a bond as a free to play through countless hours of crafting jewelry and high alchemy and decided after all that effort that i'm not going to let this chance go to waste I challenged myself to make back the money that I spent on a bond so I would have to go back, but how would I do that in just two weeks? With the advice from a knowledgeable friend and some others who I knew to be familiar with the game, I made a rough plan for how I'll be spending the time to get back where I was and streamed it all on Twitch, while having absolutely no idea how realistic my plan would be. To my surprise though, I ended up doubling the money that I needed while also working on other things in parallel, and in this video, I'll be sharing that journey for those who might also be looking to safeguard their membership or are simply curious to see how I did it. A small disclaimer before we get started though, I did have membership on this account a long time ago, but this was mostly wasted on exploring and trying out some membership features. The only relevant thing to the challenge that I skipped was unlocking the fossil island by completing the dig site quest and reaching hunter level 9, which allowed me to get to doing birdhouse runs sooner, which I'll explain later in the video. This would only save me a few hours with proper guidance, and you'll see for yourself that I wasn't exactly lacking time. With that out of the way though, let's get started. Before I got involved with any sort of money making, I had to make sure that I had the basic necessities in order. One of these in particular was reaching Prayer 43 to unlock Protect from Melee, which I wasn't able to achieve during my time in free-to-play. Protection prayers are paramount when it comes to most PvE content, and I knew I would be challenging difficult quests along the way, so it was a necessary investment to get started with my journey. To do this, I wanted to go to a place deep in the wilderness called the Chaos Temple. Using bones in its altar would multiply the experience gained by 3.5 times along with a 50% chance to not consume the bones used. While going to the wilderness comes with the obvious risk of being attacked by players, the risk was a lot less scary than spending the amount I already did several times over on dragon bones. You could also achieve the same amount of prayer experience through the fully lit gilded altars in player housings, offering a much safer alternative but also lacking the possibility of not consuming any bones. If that interests you, I'll be talking more about accessing player houses later in the video. To get to the Chaos Temple, I used a teleportation item called the Burning Amulet. This allows you to teleport to several locations in the wilderness, but in this case to the Lava Maze which is only a short walk away from the temple. With this setup, the process was really simple. Fill your inventory with bones, use the amulet, run to the temple, use your bones, and hopefully make it out alive. The complication here is that because this is higher than level 20 wilderness, teleportation of any form isn't possible from the location, so you have to either get yourself killed or spend some time running away from the temple before you could use any teleportation items. On later runs, I was using Ring of Dueling as a cheap option for teleportation. It had been a while since I last played RuneScape when I first started the challenge, so when player killers did inevitably come around, I had zero clue how to handle myself like forgetting to turn off auto retaliate and ended up losing my bones multiple times during the process. What a great opportunity to share my wealth with the locals. Despite the bumps in the road though, after a few hundred thousand gold and a fairly short amount of time, I reached Prayer 43. I need to do Nature Spirits and Lost City for this quest, okay. The prayers came in handy really soon after learning them, as the next thing in my to-do list was unlocking perhaps one of the most important teleport networks in the game, the Fairy Rings. To accomplish this, one must complete Fairy Tale 1 and achieve partial completion on the follow-up quest Fairy Tale 2, so that the Fairy Ring network would be introduced to the player and then given full access to afterwards. The first part already came with a couple enemies around combat level 100, which the protection prayers did wonders against. After obtaining the Draven Staff through the first part required to use the Fairy Rings, and unlocking the network itself through a second part, it was time to set the grand plan in motion. A lot of the membership content offers plenty of great ways to make money, but the summer reality is that most of them would require so much time to grind before they'd actually become profitable, that by the time you'd start earning anything decent, your two weeks would already be over. And as ideal as it would be, you can't exactly rely on people to come and bring you gifts just so you can keep playing the game. However, there is one skill that wouldn't be so hard or expensive to turn profitable in a relatively short amount of time, which also remained to be my main source of income for the whole journey. Farming. Now for those who are not familiar with farming, the idea is simple. All around Gilinor, there are these farming patches which you can plant crops in depending on what patch type it is, provided that you have the seeds and the required skill to plant them. There are allotments, flower and tree patches, only to name a few, but the ones I was particularly interested in 
were the herb patches. If you look into the available calculators in the OSRS wiki, there is a calculator specifically made for farming herbs. After putting in all the relevant information such as your farming level and how many patches you have, you will be given a calculation on how much gold you'll gain on average each time you harvest all of your herb patches. These are known as herb runs. What the results show us is that there's a bunch of herbs that will grant you as much as 25,000 GP per patch, which might not sound like a lot at first, but I'll show you exactly why this is an absurd amount. The first question that might come to mind is, how many patches can you actually have? There are as many as 10 different herb patches that you can unlock in Gilinor with varying difficulty, some being immediately accessible and some that might take an eternity to unlock. If you look into the herb patches page in the OSRS wiki, you can find the locations for each patch and possible requirements that they may have, along with the best methods for traveling to these locations. According to this, there's actually as many as 6 patches that you can easily utilize even as a newbie, with some of them behind very easy quests that unlock their respective areas, Children of the Sun for Civitas Illa Fortis, and Priest in Peril for Mauritania. What this means is that with a little effort, you can stand to gain as much as around 150,000 GP each herb run. What makes this sound further bewildering is that you can actually make herb runs nearly every hour. To understand what this really means, it's important that I explain herb growth cycles in better detail. Farming in OSRS isn't actually based on a set timer from the moment you plant the crop, but rather a fixed timer that will update all crops that are currently growing. This varies depending on the plot type, but in the case of herbs this timer is 20 minutes, updating at every 15, 35 and 55 minutes of every hour. Herbs require 4 ticks to fully grow, so depending on the time you plant your crops, it can take 60 to 80 minutes for the herbs to be ready again. In any case, the growth cycle is pretty frequent and herb runs only take a few minutes to do, making them an incredibly effective source of passive income. Now that I've frantically marketed farming for you, another question remains. How quickly can you monetize it? And this, ladies and gentlemen, or anything beyond or in between, is the point where I'll strike you with awe if I haven't managed already. You can start earning this much as early as farming level 32 or 38 if you want to be safe by growing Ranar weed or Toad Flax respectively. Which honestly, isn't even all that hard to achieve as long as you're willing to invest a few hours into leveling farming. With most of our money making methods, you'd require a lot of money to invest or an absurdly high skill level to achieve in mere 2 weeks such as 80 or higher, but this requires neither from you. And for a member just starting out, it's the perfect opportunity. So now that the groundwork was done, it was time I started working on earning the money that I need to continue my membership and to get back what I've lost. Or so I thought, but learning to manage all the farming with no prior knowledge was no easy task. Before I could even get to farming herbs, I had to level farming through other patches to unlock my first herb type, Guam Leaf, and go even further to reach the level required to cultivate profitable herbs. The workload kept piling up though as I'd start unlocking tree and fruit tree patches and start growing those along with herbs and other plants at the same time, so I'd initially keep forgetting where all the patches are located and in what order I should do the plots, so I wouldn't waste run energy and time. What I learned during this chaos is that it's better to just focus on one plot type at a time, even if it meant making more runs through the same areas. This means less tools you'll have to carry with you, leaving more space for the actual produce and allows the crop growth cycles to be more in sync with one another. At first, I did try to get everything done at the same time, but what that ended up doing was make the run so slow that by the time I was done, some crops would be ready for harvest while the more recent plantations would still need some time before they were ripe for picking. This would force me to go do something else while they'd all grow up unless I wanted to stand and wait for my crops to grow, which wasn't ideal, especially when streaming. It took me a while, but in a few days time, I finally started to get the hang of it. I'd start doing herb runs a few times a day, with each run generating me a whopping 150,000 on average, netting nearly a million on a daily basis. There are also some things that I would have never realized to take advantage of if it wasn't for the advice that people gave me on stream. You can use any crop that you have on the Tool Leprechaun present at every patch in the game, and he would turn them into notes for you for free. This was a massive quality of life improvement as prior to that I had to manually run to the bank and back or bring baskets and sacks with me if I wanted to keep everything. I was also able to utilize the menu entry swapper plugin that I was told to get at the very beginning to not accidentally bury my bones at the chaos temple, allowing me to change my left click function from cleaning or eating to using, making it even more convenient to use. 
You can also make use of POH or player owned houses to gain access to many of the basic spellbook and jewelry teleports in the event you haven't unlocked some of them or don't want to spend money on jewelry. There's this server type called House Party, which is intended towards players hosting their own POH publicly, allowing you to use all of its facilities freely. Most of the houses also have a pool of rejuvenation to fill your energy and hit points with, as well as a gilded altar for a safer alternative to sacrifice your bones with, boostable with the use of incense. World 330 in particular is a very active server for house parties, but is also often full during peak times. Alternative servers are valid too, but there might be times when there are no good houses being hosted. I personally used the POH system frequently to travel between places as run energy became a constant struggle and I highly recommend getting your magic level high enough to directly teleport to player housing as well. As I was getting the hang of farming, I also started looking into another potential source of income, the birdhouse runs. For these, you need to do the dig site quest that I mentioned earlier to gain access to a place called Fossil Island. In there, you can find 4 spots which you can place birdhouse traps in and after 55 minutes of waiting, you can collect them. The primary incentive for doing this are the bird nests, which are priced at around 8000 GP apiece as they're needed for Ceradomin brews. The amount of bird nests obtained depends on the birdhouse trap that you use, which unlock with further hunter levels, so the amount that you obtain gradually increases as you keep doing it. Earning about 50,000 worth in bird nests for a minute's trip around an island, give or take, doesn't sound like a bad deal for me even if the beginning was a little slow. To make birdhouse traps you need clockworks, one for each birdhouse. These are returned each time you dismantle a birdhouse trap during your runs, so you'll only ever need four. Then you need any generic logs suitable to be made into a birdhouse, provided you have the required hunter level to make them. You'll also need a hammer and chisel with you for the crafting process, and some seeds to trap the birdhouses with, ten for each. Any seed will do, so do scrap the cheapest available from a grand exchange, and you're good to go. Birdhouse runs work really well along with herb runs as they also require just about an hour to harvest, so I could run them both at the same time without issue, resulting in about 200,000 of income per harvest. As these were primarily passive sources of income, I was also left with spare time on other grinds and activities. I wasn't satisfied with just the bare minimum and wanted to use this opportunity to make more out of farming, which meant having to unlock more herb plots. From all the options left, there was still the farming guild patch, the troll stronghold patch, the wise patch and the harmony island patch. The farming guild patch would unlock at farming 65, which I knew would happen in time, but the three of us were actually stuck behind some hard quests and achievements. The patch in Troll Stronghold proved itself to be the easiest to obtain, as well as something I'd eventually need to do if I want to unlock Wise in the future. <laughs> Even though I call it the easiest, unlocking the patch in Troll Stronghold was far from simple. I'll be very clear that if your character is not suited for combat and you're not prepared to get yourself into difficult fights, this is the point where you should stop. The Troll Stronghold might be the easiest of the three to unlock, but still involves several fights with enemies above 100 combat level and advanced attack patterns. I was blessed to have an absurdly high magic level due to high alchemy grinding to help deal with most encounters and my melee stats around base 50s, but even then face some struggles. But if you have what it takes and want to squeeze every penny out of farming, I recommend doing the same. At this point in the video, I pretty much mentioned everything relevant to how I mostly made my money during the two weeks, so if you came looking for answers just for that, feel free to click away and go about your day. I won't resent you for that, I'm very grateful that I've kept you interested this long, I wouldn't want to keep you longer than necessary. Good luck with making a fortune through farming. But, if you want to hear more about how I managed to make the process even more efficient, all the while keeping the money flowing, and the other things that I managed to achieve, please do stick around. I was quite surprised by how much I was able to accomplish during these two weeks, and I'm eager to share the journey with you as well. Unlocking Troll Stronghold was by far the longest project I've had in RuneScape at the time. A lot of groundwork was necessary, including several quests and quest lines that had to be completed, along with skill requirements that some of these quests would have and I'd go out of my way to either grind or do additional quests that would yield experience for them. Working on the long Trollheim quest line became a routine for me while making Herobrons in regular intervals, and I would spend several days trying to complete everything. Eventually, toward the end of my first week, I was finally able to unlock the quest and probably experience one of the most hilarious quests in my entire life. After all the hard work to reach this far, there was certainly room for some lighthearted fun as well, and the adventure with my arm was certainly a memorable one. Before I start helping you with the whole farming thing, could you just explain where you're called my arm? That's easy. You know what trolls get named after their first thing what we try to eat when we're young? It's where my dad's arm. And no one thinks it's a silly name? 
Well, I seen worse. Most humans come through here, they get nice with like all numbers and things what aren't even words. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm having this very strong feeling that this is gonna be turning into one big masturbation joke. Remember guys, this day, when we have when we have declared that my arm is our arm. May my arm bless us all to be our arm together. There is no my arm, there is only our arm. We may all use the same arm. For the whatever we need to. We use the arm together. My arm is ours forever. My arm is everyone's to use. My arm is powerful. Our arm. The real challenge, however, would await towards the end of the quest where you had to take down a giant rock. Despite the high stats that I mentioned earlier, I actually had to retreat once during this fight and switch over the magic gear as the fight was pretty difficult in melee range and my spell damage was way better. After some struggling, I eventually managed to beat it and finally obtained my just reward, a disease-free patch on top of the troll stronghold. And even though it would be difficult to get there during her bronze's trolls would maul me on the way, I couldn't say no to the extra gold. The troll stronghold wasn't the end of the road for me, however. Even though I knew it would be a long stretch and would take an immense amount of work, I started working towards the wise patch and the skill requirements alone for the quest are insane. I knew that I wouldn't be able to unlock the herb patch during my bond, but I didn't start working on the requirements just for that. I had additional reasons to level some of the related skills, more specifically agility and fire making. I wanted to level agility to get my hands on a really useful set called Graceful Outfit, which grants significant boost weight reduction and runs them in efficiency, and fire make it to unlock the winter thought boss for a fun and effective way to level up the skill while getting bonus loot along the way. I had my worries over how plausible this objectives would be over the span of a week, but those were washed away as soon as I calculated how much I had earned by far on my seventh day. 9 million when we started, 25 million we got as a gift, um, 3.5 million we got in goods, and now um, we got 2 million in terms of items, or 1.5 million if I'm giving the plate skirts to Maddie. 9 million, 25 million, um, 34 million, then 37.5 million roughly. And once we put in the other stuff that I just got, it's 39.5 million. Right now, I got 43 million in my bank alone. And we got 5 million in GE. I got 7 million! Actually, hold on. 925.34, because now the Abyssal Whip and the Dragon Blade Legs are out of there. So, the initial value of the bank without my stuff, like, you know, that I already had. There would be 3.5 million in the bank. Which would mean that my net value right now is about 8.5 million. Excuse me, what? At this point, I wasn't nearly as concerned about making ends meet, and decided to focus more on skilling and other unlocks that could prove useful later on. Graceful Outfit and Winter Thought became my primary focuses for the following days, especially the Graceful Outfit as that would come in handy with farming too. But since I didn't want my streams to be all about jumping on rooftops, I had something else in mind too. Another milestone that came to my mind was unlocking the Dragon Scimitar, which would require the completion of another difficult quest, Monkey Madness 1, and reaching Attack 60, which is required to wield it. This also gave me an excuse to complete the quest required to unlock another form of transport, Spirit Trees, as these quests also happen to be prerequisites for Monkey Madness 1. This would become useful with farming as well, as Spirit Trees would take me directly to several tree locations and allow me to use them in POHs too. Truth to its name, this quest succeeded at pushing me to my very limits, being potentially harder than Troll Stronghold itself and making me go through several fits of panic. I did make it through eventually, although not without reducing my mental capacity to that of an actual monkey. Well, they're attacking me! There's still way, way too much monkey business, guys. Way too much monkey business. I'm losing control. Shut the f up, old man. This is not the right time for you to be pestering me. Hey, Evanalus, would you like to come and solve a maze for me? No, I'm busy! Fuck off! Hey, friends! It's lovely to see you! Oh, hey! Hi! 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 Jokes aside, though, since I was working on reaching Attack 60 anyway, I also took the opportunity to start leveling Slayer in the meantime, as I heard that it would make some good money after the 70s or so. It was also a great opportunity to learn about the later monsters in the game while learning to play around with prayers better. Eventually, when I did reach Attack 60 though, the upgrade was massive and all the grinding definitely paid off. Yes, there it is! Attack 60! 
Man, was it a grind. 45,000 attack EXP today. That's like fifth of my whole attack experience in my whole life in this on, in the, on this character. That's insane. My max hit currently without any combat potions is 14. 22 melee strength and 22 slash attack bonus. Oh, it looks so good. Okay. I want to see the max hit happen. 16! Right there! Right there! 16! Oh my freaking god! I really want to try the combat potion! I really want to try, but I don't want to waste it! You know what? It's only 4k. And this is this is only gonna happen once. Max hit 17 with our prayers. With prayers. 19. Let's go for 19, boys. 18! Oh, 11! No, this is broken, dude. I can almost do the 20s already with the potions. Oh my god. 19, right there. We did 19, boys. At number 18. Oh my god, this thing. This is an absolute Chad weapon. After that, I eventually assembled a full graceful outfit and I wasn't really left with much time to work on any other projects. So I started mining in Motherload Mine to reach the mining requirement for Vice Her Patch. I also took the opportunity to try out some mini games that I would probably play more somewhere in the future, but didn't bother getting too far with it, knowing how little time I had left. Before the final day, though, one of my viewers asked me if I've heard of a strategic mini game called Barbarian Assault, which I hadn't until that point. He told me about this suit that would be ideal for a lower defense level player like me, called the Fighter Torso, providing a melee strength bonus which would otherwise only be seen on higher level armor pieces under a steep price tag. He asked if I wanted to do it, to which I responded in agreement because I really liked the idea of a group-oriented strategy game. He told me that I should watch a guide on it before getting involved, however, and this honestly had me a little nervous given the high established entry-level requirements. And I had a good reason to be. After watching a guide about it the next morning, I was devastated over how much information there was to process. To put it simply, the minigame consists of four roles and all of them have different tasks that they have to do in order to clear the room from monsters to progress through stages, unable to directly intervene with others. They are reliant on each other though, as players have to call out what somebody else has to use to perform their task correctly, and this has to be done every 30 seconds through a calling horn found in each player's inventory. Coordinating this kind of group work with randoms can be excruciatingly painful, as everyone needs to know what they're doing, and for that reason there are boosting services that might even charge you hundreds of millions of GP just to do the grind for you. And people actually pay for this. Taking that into consideration after the fact, I was incredibly fortunate that Pure Cheese was willing to team up with me along with some of his friends, most notably Soundtry for being with us for the entire ride. And that doesn't mean I was being boosted either, I also bore responsibility and the group's performance heavily relying on the fact that I knew what I was doing. I had to grind 500 points from playing the game and repeat this with all the roles if I wanted to get my hands on the fighter torso. The grind was tough, but I was made aware that I wouldn't usually have an opportunity like this as for most groups base 60 combat sets are a bare minimum, which I didn't have at the time. To them however, I was just strong enough to not screw the group over entirely at least most of the time, which kept me committed to the cause. What had initially started off as a fairly stressful and intense experience, soon took a change in direction and turned into something really fun and engaging to do together as hours flew by, and by the end of it, I had finally gathered enough points to claim my last reward. Guys, four hours, and we did it. Four freaking melee strength. Yes! Yes! <laughs> that took so much effort. That, that, you know, I feel manly already. And as the day came to a close, so did my last moments with my first well-earned bond. When I first started this challenge, I expected it to be a two-week experience of me barely scraping the barrel to make ends meet and be able to continue my bond subscription. What it turned out to be instead was a much more fruitful adventure, and many of the experiences that I had along with the money-making are memories that I certainly won't be forgetting anytime soon. Not only did I manage to hold on to my membership, I even managed to double the money by the end of it and felt time and time again that I had achieved something great in the game. And considering the many objectives that I've already set ahead of me, I feel that there's still so much more to look forward to. I know this was a long video and I ended up talking about more than just the way I made the money for my next bond, but I hope you enjoyed it regardless. And if you happen to be a fellow free-to-play player about to take their first step into the world of members, I hope that this video has taught you something and given you inspiration for what else to work on as well. If you would like to see more OSRS content, do let me know in the comments below. All suggestions for what you'd like to see next are welcome. 
Do you also consider dropping in my feature streams to catch up on my latest adventures, usually on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, to the best of my capability? If you're interested, I'll leave a link to my Twitch down in the description below, so you can leave a follow if you would like to be notified when I'm streaming next. Let me also know your thoughts about the video and the questions that you might have in the comments below, I'll be answering them as frequently as possible. You can also consider joining my Discord server, I'll answer any pings in there as soon as I'm able. I'll leave a link to it in the description as well. Either way though, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you on the next one. But until then, it's bye bye.